Welcome to the Remarkable Relationship Show with Mercy Russell, where we find the wonder in your story. I will be your host for the next hour. I have over 35 years of experience applying the science of relationship systems to my practice of psychotherapy and leadership consulting. My intuitive skills allow me to bring clarity and vision to your challenges. I hope you will be surprised in the next hour. Good morning. This is Mercy Russell with the Remarkable Relationship Show. My goal is to bring a fresh perspective to you on all things related to how humans develop their individual brilliance while navigating the excitement, stickiness, and resistance in their relationships. In my 40 years of working as a psychotherapist and consultant, I have been continually amazed at the ways in which people overcome challenges. I hope to share my experience and insight so you can find the magic in your relationships. My hope in this show is to answer questions and challenges you are facing in your relationships. There are several ways you can ask me a question. You can send me a question by email at mercy at leadershipwithmercy.com. This gives you anonymity since I will not share the identity of the listener asking the question. I often disguise the identity of the listener by changing details while addressing the problematic dynamic. My answers will be available during the show as well as on the KKNW podcasts and the KKNW YouTube channel. In addition, I post transcripts of the show on my website, leadershipwithmercy.com. Please don't be shy about asking questions. I recognize that it can take courage to call into a radio show, especially about personal matters. I have rarely heard a unique dilemma. Your question will help other people listening to the show. Plus, this allows me to know what interests you. I'm interested in all corners of human behavior and relationships, so I need your help to know how I can address what troubles and intrigues you. Eventually, I hope to have listeners call into the show. I'm excellent on the spot, knowledgeable, and intuitive. As a listener, I get so much more from a conversation between the host and the caller, so it's good to listen in to to other people talk. So let me just double check something here. Um, Yeah, just checking here, checking in with Benny a little bit. (laughs) Today I will be talking about parenting styles when parents don't agree. Um, A listener asks the following question. My husband and I have different approaches with raising the kids. He has his way, I have mine. I'm trying to get better at telling him to calm down. Our child is only four years old. For example, eating together with all the family and cousins, he would make him sit and eat and they would both get upset. But our son was only two or three or four. It's exciting and fun to let him freaking play. He can eat later. My family calls him the food Nazi. Upside down smile emoji. He's kind of uptight about things and I'm more laid back. So then we get upset with each other. What different approaches can I take? How do we compromise and meet in the middle? Wonderful question. And I'm glad you're asking it now when your son is only four years old. I have specific suggestions. However, first I'm going to lay out some background and how I think about parenting and family dynamics. I will give suggestions and you should experiment with similar approaches to what I might suggest. So I step back first and I start with the big picture. That's just who I am. I discuss the fundamental differences between couples. 
starting with sexual reproduction and the evolution of our species based in family and childbearing practices. Then looking at the fundamental emotional dynamics in the family, I give specific feedback and suggestions on how my listener can negotiate with her husband. Now I'm hoping with this larger evolutionary biological perspective on parenting that this will help you to see your situation more calmly and give you more options to think about how you can communicate and negotiate. A natural history of parenting. So we often take it for granted that parents should be on the same page about raising their children. However, there are a lot of reasons that mothers and fathers would not agree. So here we go back in time. So let's start with the advent of sexual reproduction, which evolved after billions of years of asexual reproduction on this planet. Asexual reproduction produces clones with genetic differences that come about really only by accident. So otherwise, all the offspring are identical. This is produced, this is a rapid form of reproduction, and it produces a high number of offspring. Um, however, if there's any difficulty in those offspring relating, dealing with it, challenges in the environment, then, then they all go down. Now, sexual reproduction, which actually started with single cell organisms, with amoeba, sexual reproduction involves the combination of genes from two different individuals who contribute a sperm and an egg. Now, actually, they, there's some thinking that actually that sexual reproduction started with a vi with the virus entering a cell and going into the nucleus and dumping their genetic material there. So the, um, this was a very simple biological process, but it resulted in what they call increased fitness or greater, greater um, strength of the offspring to survive. Now, think about it. <laughs> From the very start, there's a, fat, a very a vast difference. Bear with me. Sperm are microscopic, racing in a mad dash with a million competitors or millions of competitors to penetrate one big, fat, lazy egg. All right. Here we've got the male contribution and the female contribution. All but one of those sperm rarely more. I mean, there would be more if, you know, you end up with twins or triplets that are not, that are fraternal and not identical, but generally it's only one of those sperm that succeed and the rest die. Um, in successful fertilization, the genes from the sperm and the egg combine equally as the egg begins to divide and the combined genes duplicate so they, they come together and then they, then they duplicate or, and then they differentiate. And so they, as they duplicate, they then begin to differentiate. They take different paths determined by the genes to produce different parts of the growing organism. As we all know, the donors designated male and female also have very different strategies in producing offspring. For, and then when I'm using male and female here, I'm not just talking about humans. I'm talking about the range of species in which there is this um, sort of this sex difference, right? And then having to do with the role that they, that they biologically play or physically play in the reproduction and the passing on of genes. So this, the designated male and female have different strategies. For the male to ensure that his genes will be passed on to an offspring, the best strategy is to deliver as many sperm as possible to as many eggs as possible. 
The best strategy for the female, on the other hand, is to attract the highest quality sperm to produce offspring, which will have a good chance of survival and reproducing to pass along her genes. Now, some females have more than one egg. So they, when they produce a litter or um, you know, a, a spawn, which is what happens with fish, there can be many offspring. Um, and this, this enhances the possibility that at least one of those will survive and pass along her genes. Then we'll see, you know, of course, with humans and with many mammals, it's just, there's really just one egg, right? So it, uh, there's a lot placed in getting the right sperm for the, because of the law of the, the possibility of that one offspring surviving. So for feet, for males, as many as possible for females just trying to get the best as possible for the number of eggs she has. Now, sexual reproduction evolved in what we call eukaryotes, which are single-celled animals with a nucleus, like uh, amoeba or fungi. Um, organisms that reproduce sexually are more adaptive to changing physical environments. So the combination of genes from different genetic lines gives more variation in the offspring. It actually makes for um, a stronger, um, a stronger offspring um, because they have more capability of having variation in the genes that will let them survive challenges that the, that maybe they're you know, predecessors didn't have to face. Now, some won't survive this combination of genes. Um, and some with the combination of genes will do better than their parents. Now, sexual reproduction has led to the evolution of more complex and higher forms of life, made it possible. This success is based on the contribution of two different organisms, which may have competing needs, drives, and strategies for reproductive success. Does this sound like you and your husband? I'm not done with my scientific lecture yet. However, I begin here, I begin to argue that your differences are a good thing. It's part of your strength. As I proceed, I will talk about how to optimize those differences for your son's benefit. But first, let's talk about parental care across species that reproduce sexually. Many species have no instinct for parental care after fertilization or birth. These can include some plants, fish, and reptiles. Many species, especially warm-blooded ones, have an instinct for maternal care, at least until the offspring can feed themselves. In some species, including 80% of fish, offspring are cared for by fathers. Now, the best known example of this, if you want to look it up, is seahorses. This is believed to be linked to the fact that fertilization doesn't take place in the female's body, it takes place in the water. Both eject sperm and, and um, an egg. The females can therefore swim away and leave, but the males are more likely to stay around to guard the territory. So it's part of the territorial instinct that they are left, they're hanging around the fertilized offspring and will take care of them. In only 20% of mammals are the father, the primary caretakers, very different. Now, for, for example, there's the vole. The vole is a small rodent, they're, but they're two closely related species that, have, that differ greatly here. In one, the prairie vole, the male is involved in care of the offspring and stays with one mate for a lifetime. In the other, the montane vole, the male mates with multiple females and does not form a pair bond with any female or provide any care or protection during the reproductive cycle. Researchers have identified that the prairie vole has higher levels of vasopressin and oxytocin, which are the neurochemicals involved in bonding. 
So it's not difficult to see that human males can fit these types as well. They represent two different strategies to ensure that the father's genes will be passed along to offspring who survive. One is to protect the mother and the offspring to ensure their survival. The other is to maximize the number, whoops, the number of offspring to increase their odds of survival. Okay, we're going to take a break now. Uh, I'll give you a little break from this and go on to talk about family dynamics. This is Mercy Russell with the Remarkable Relationship Show. I'm talking about a listener's question about competing parental styles between a mother and a father. All clear. Alternative Talk 1150 is your sports organization's safe bet when it comes to airing your team's games. Our players are all seasoned professionals when it comes to sports programming. Imagine your games being heard on local radio. Your team deserves the MVP treatment. Call 425-653-1150 today to learn how affordable and fun it is to broadcast your games on the radio. Call 425-653-1150 and make your next season something special. That's 425-653-1150. Hi, tune in to my new show, The Remarkable Relationship Show, with me, Mercy Russell. I bring a fresh perspective on all things related to how humans develop their individual brilliance while navigating the excitement, stickiness, and resistance in their relationships. Wednesdays from 9 to 10 a.m., and you can visit my website at leadershipwithmercy.com. Want to hear something different from talk radio? Keep your dial on Alternative Talk 1150. Hello, this is Mercy Russell with the Remarkable Relationship Show, and today I'm talking about parenting styles when parents don't agree. So I've just been talking about sort of the, our evolutionary background as a species in terms of um, child rearing and parental care. Um, and I was just talking about um, two different types of rodents in which the males have very different roles. One is very involved in parenting. The other one is sort of a love and leave them type of bull. And this we see, of course, in humans. Um, now, humans, unlike most other primates, that means primates are like chimpanzees, gibbons, um, gorillas, um, are, but are, are primary biparental, meaning both the male and the female take care of their offspring. Not all pairs do this, but paternal care is part of the human repertoire. Now, humans are serially monogamous. So that means that they form a pair bond for reproducing. Um, and the male often provides food and shelter for the female and the offspring. However, they're not instinctually monogamous for a lifetime. This is on a species level. And their mating pair patterns will vary. Some humans pair for a lifetime. If a mate dies, they do not find or look for another mate. Some humans form more than one pair bond, um, one at a time, sometimes more than one at a time. And if one, if their primary pair, pair dies or leaves, they establish another pair. They have the capability of being in more than one pair in a lifetime. And some humans reproduce without ever forming a pair. So, you know, humans can take advantage of the whole range of possibilities. Now, usually females are the primary caretakers with humans. Sometimes male are equal partners of caretakers and raising young. Sometimes their primary role is providing food and shelter. Sometimes they're not involved at all. Of course, sometimes males <clears throat> are the primary caretakers and females are not involved in caretaking. So uh, we, see this, we see this whole range again. Culturally, we've come to see the equal sharing of parenting responsibilities as being normal. However, it's also useful to see that it's really more of a choice. 
with a wide range of variability. Are you taking your husband's interest in how his son is raised for granted? Are you assuming that this is just natural and the right thing for any human father to do? Or can you appreciate who he is? I might note here that patriarchal societies have created a dominance hierarchy that has given men and fathers more control over their pair bonds and offspring. This is another big topic, and it started with the ownership of property and, and, and agriculture, <clears throat> when actually the pair bond needed to stay together to survive. Okay, this is a natural counterbalance, this sort of dominance structure for the natural dominance of the female in reproduction. So the female central to reproduction, and you can kind of see, you know, that it, it, it gives the men a leg up. Now, you know, with a lot of, we're very focused these days on the negatives of a patriarchal society, but just to say this is, you can see the different reasons it's evolved. However, in the family dynamic, the male or the father is often on the periphery of the mother and her emotional attachment to her children. So, you know, this is a living reality for us. And I think it's important, despite our beliefs about how things should be, to see that there is a fundamental dynamic here. That's also supported by our physiology, you know, the females um, bonding, uh, 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 neural hormones, and the, the, what happens between a mother and infant in nursing. You know, these are just biological facts. So <clears throat> what we call humans today are homo sapiens. We're also descended from other species of humans, and call, including Neanderthals. The one reason homo sapiens survived is because they lived in a multi-family genetically related groups of about 80 individuals. Neanderthals lived in small nuclear family groups, you know, maybe with a, you know, with, a, you know, child parents and grandparents of seven to 10. So the, the, this larger group provided more protection for survivability. So a man and a woman having a child in human in the Homo sapien tribe were living in a multi generational tribe in which family members also all, all family members in addition to the father also provided food shelter and participated in raising and teaching children. So we don't know how the dynamic between a man and a woman's families evolved in that in that time, but we can see what it looks like today. So these two, mother and father, are both coming from extended families. How did those families relate to each other? Um, and how is that part of evolution? That's something that we don't know a lot about right now. So your fight with your husband about parenting is taking place in the context of his family and yours, and most likely the differences between them. Culturally, we have come to see the equal sharing of parenting responsibilities as a norm. However, it's also useful to see that it is really more of a choice. Now, it might be guided by, you know, ex culture, expectations, uh, religious beliefs. It might seem very fixed. But in fact, the way people actually live is, is often based primarily on their choice to do that. Biologically, the mother is designed hormonally as the primary caretaker. So how does a father who wants an equal role compete with his dependence on her to bear, nurse, and care for the child? Her, how does he compete with her, with her mother, who is guides her in parenting and with her mother's family. Now your question highlights this tension and you also provide the answer. Your husband has a strong opinion about what he wants to teach his child about me eating meals with the family. You and your family don't see meal time as a time to teach a child about social behavior at meals. 
Now, neither opinion, this is, I don't know that that's exactly true, but let's just say those are the differences. Now, neither opinion is right here. Parenting involves educating children in appropriate social behavior, and young children like to play. Both sides are true. In a way, you're ganging up on your husband. Predictably, he's taking a stand for himself. And maybe his family is on, on his side too, even if they're not at the table. I have a few other ideas to offer, which might give you some clues about what you can do to break this stalemate. So how do families work? All humans and other forms of life have two conflicting drives. They have a need for social connection and togetherness and a need for individuality. And the human family is an emotional unit. It's, it's the, in a way, the individual person is a myth. It's a reality. We all live in this group. That's not to say our individuality isn't important. It's just to say we're inextricably linked in emotional systems, um, whether they're present or not, and whether there are biological families or other social groups we've become part of. Interactions among family members and in social groups follow predictable patterns. Now, the togetherness force is the drive for social connectedness and interdependence. It's necessary for survival. And it's integral to how the human evolved as a social species. We need this connection with each other. On the other hand, the individuality force, which is the drive for individual growth and differentiation from the group, is also a necessary component for evolution. We need this variation. We each need to bring our best selves to the group and not to always just go along with the crowd, right? So that's, that's this inherent national, natural tension that we have. So let's back up to what happens when uh, a couple gets together in the family. So the driving force for young adults is to separate from their parents. And the emotional drive for marriage is to form a union. So early emotions in a courtship, in mating, in marriage are for togetherness. You know, we're to, it's you and me against the world. Um, and this sometimes doesn't even make it to the altar. Sometimes this, the things, is, the, things have already started to change. But there's a, a general agreement that you know, we want to agree, we want to be on the same page, and we're together. Soon after, after the marriage, the drive for individuality begins to compete with its togetherness. And this creates a natural and healthy tension in the relationship. There's nothing wrong with this. It's just who we are. So, and then even though the couple has started a new family, they are each still in the waterfall of emotion flowing down from older and previous generations in the family, often, you know, sort of denying it or not paying attention to it or not thinking it's important when they're young. But nevertheless, the emotion from the parents, aunts and uncles, grandparents, culture is, is, is affecting them. And they each bring a packet of life anxiety into the marriage that has come from these families. These are just facts. There's nothing, we're not talking pathological anxiety. We're talking about life force. And they're also each susceptible to anxiety flowing through events in the larger family and the environment during their marriage. So the, either, there's a feeling of we're an island, but in fact, we're not. So when the cozy togetherness of the new couple becomes tense because of the drive for individuality, the dyad becomes unstable. So this, uh, and there's a, often conflict and tension. Well, the natural, um, the natural phenomenon, which actually didn't start in humans, I think it's, you can observe it in amoeba, is a third person is recruited. 
So one person in this tense dyad will bring another person in to take their side in the conflict. That's one way it works. This calms that person down. But it can leave the other person on the outside and make them feel more vulnerable and anxious. Now, this triangle, there are other, lots of other ways the triangle works, but this triangle this is a stable and basic emotional unit. It's like a three-legged stool. It's natural. It's not pathological. In the family constellation, the fundamental third person in a triangle will be the child. Now, sometimes the tension that motivates bringing a third person in, whether it's a friend or getting pregnant, is anxiety picked up from another person in the extended families or a stressful life event. Um, not always, but you know, it's something to keep an eye on. Now, these triangles are always active in the family. Triangles, I've talked about them before. That's a whole topic in and of itself. But just to know that when the couple has a child, this creates a triangle. Sometimes the couple keeps their togetherness and both relate emotionally equal, equally to the child. And they share caretaking of the infant. So I think a nice example of this is my son and daughter-in-law with my granddaughter, uh, who's about 20 months old. She, um, um, because she was bottle fed, my son was very involved in her caretaking really from the moment that she was born. So they equally shared feeding her, getting up in the middle of the night. He always took his turn. He also, you know, emphasized having a lot of skin to skin contact with her from an early time. And even to this day, they divide right down the middle responsibilities for dressing her, putting her to bed, um, driving her to daycare, all of the, all of the feeding her, all of the caretaking roles. So this is, um, this is an example of when a couple is able to, to, to share those responsibilities. Now, sometimes the mother joins the child in a new togetherness, leaving the father in the outside position. Then the father can react in different ways. And this is just a biological, sometimes very strong emotional um, move that is not bad. It's just kind of what can happen. And I'll give you an example of that. So the father can feel neglected by the wife and resent the attention that she pays to the child. This creates conflict. He can try to get back into an inside position by pressuring the mother for attention or by competing with her for care of the infant. Or he can feel relieved to be outside the intense caretaking that's required for a new infant. And then this creates distance. So this is what happened in my first marriage. I became completely absorbed with my son. I had a very strong emotional reaction to him when he was born, very positive. And I also nursed. And <clears throat> so I was a hands-on primary caretaker. I was happy to do it. And <clears throat> my husband was happy to let me do it. But this was the beginning of creating distance between us. Or Another way a father can react is to feel left out and to step in to take a role in the care of the infant. This happened in my second marriage. So when I would be rushing, when my son would go to bed and fuss and I'd rush upstairs to nurse him, to put him back to sleep, my husband at one point stopped and said, no, I'm going. If you want me to be involved as a father, he has to learn to, be, to let me calm him down too. So this was an example of a father who stepped in, pushed the mother aside and said, no, this child has to deal with me. So children very soon can learn to maneuver in this triangle, learning who to go in order to get what they want.
Um, you know what? This is time to take a break. I think I've kind of given you a big background here. This is on uh, on how to think about disagreement between parents about child rearing. Um, and I'm going to talk in this next section about specific ways of negotiating this, other factors to think about, and as in the, particularly for my listener, <clears throat> and um, ways that parents can sort of find their own way with this. So this is Mercy Russell with a Remarkable Relationship Show. Today I'm talking about parenting when parents don't agree. All good? The life of every child is precious. If you care for a child or teenager with a disability and have limited income and resources, they may qualify for monthly cash payments through the Supplemental Security Income Program, or SSI. Call Social Security at 1-800-772-1213 or visit ssa.gov slash ssikids to learn more. That's ssa.gov slash ssikids. Message produced by Social Security at U.S. taxpayer expense. Hi, tune in to my new show, The Remarkable Relationship Show, with me, Mercy Russell. I bring a fresh perspective on all things related to how humans develop their individual brilliance while navigating the excitement, stickiness, and resistance in their relationships. Wednesdays from 9 to 10 a.m., and you can visit my website at leadershipwithmercy.com. Multicultural, multidimensional even. Alternative Talk 1150. Hello, this is Mercy Russell with the Remarkable Relationship Show. Today, I'm talking about parenting styles when parents don't agree. And I've just given you a little lecture on the evolution of our species, sexual reproduction, um, parental care. um, And they've just been talking about dynamics in the family that lead into this conflict between parents, the conflict that my listener posed. and. and ways of thinking about how she can navigate it. So what I was talking about was about the triangle, that the basic human emotional unit is a triangle. It's like it's stable, like a three-legged stool, not the dyad. I'm going to push you toward the dyad, but it's you have to remember that the that when there's conflict in a dyad, it's very sometimes hard to really just stay with that person and you pull in a third person and the most natural biological third person for a couple is a child. So, um, and then I talked about different ways in which the mother gets close to her togetherness with a child and the father may be left on the outside or how does the father come in and be an equal partner. Now, when there are differences in these in between when there's conflict and difference between the parents, children very soon learn to maneuver in this triangle. They learn who to go to in order to get what they want. They can kind of play up that difference. Well, mom doesn't want me to do that, but if I go to dad, I can get it, right? And this is where we, the stance that parents must agree comes from to prevent the child from splitting or taking advantage of this. However, parents rarely agree all the time. And a child is very sensitive to these differences, even very young children, even my 20-month-old granddaughter. Some children will take advantage of this. So I th- my, my, my um, granddaughter was in a sort of standoff with her father about getting dressed. And I walked in. And what did she do? She reached for me, right? So there I was. She's like, help me, get me out of this conflict with my dad. Um, That I was tempting. (laughs) I knew better. So a wise parent, however, will choose times to tolerate the discomfort with her spouse 
and allow the other child, uh, the other spouse to manage the unhappy child without coming in to rescue the child. Like I was able to not, to not do that. Now, other family members or friends like myself are eager to step in to relieve the tension and discomfort between the husband and the wife and the child. They can take sides, either overtly or covertly. This rarely helps. Now, if the family members are present and do not take sides, their presence can diffuse the tension and can create space for the pair to sort out their differences and distract the child. Think of the tension between the couple as, you know, being, as having a weight. And if there are other people around who are observing it, but not jumping in or reacting to it, in a way they can, they can take a little bit of the load off. And this can then help the, the original couple. But that's a, that's a tricky thing even for family members. So this, there, we, we're talking about this inherent tension in all relationships. You have a desire to be together. You and your husband want to see eye to eye. You want to be on the same page. You want that connection and that togetherness with each other. On the other hand, you have a natural urge and instinct to be separate as an individual. And you and your husband want to make your own contribution to your son. You want to be able to think for yourselves. But you don't have to always see eye to eye. Your differences in a very rich way can be a resource for your children if you know how to navigate them. What's important is that you continue to engage with your husband directly about your desire for connection and about your differences. You want to keep the natural, healthy, and inevitable conflict over differences between the two of you without bringing in a third party. <laughs> now, this conflict, conflict can increase your stress level, and the differences and conflict can feel worse when other stressors come at you from life events or environmental stressors, including your families. Sometimes a couple breaks out in a fight, not because of what's between them, but because of some outside stress. Now, it's natural to pass off this anxiety by focusing on a third person, especially a child. However, when you do that, you transfer the anxiety to the child. I've had this happen with my son and daughter-in-law, where there was a basic conflict between the two of them. Um, my, my, my daughter-in-law spoke to me about it. Uh, I listened sympathetically, but the next moment I knew she was angry at me. So this was, you know, this is just the way triangles go. You know, it's really helpful to see it because then you don't take it personally. Yeah, it feels personal, but you can calm down pretty quickly because you know what the real source of the tension is. Now, this anxiety that's flowing downstream through the triangles in the family is the root of many physical, social, or emotional symptoms. So how do you, hit, how do you manage yourself in the heat of the moment? And how do you bridge the divide with your husband? So here are my questions for you. Number one, here's, here's my advice. Ask yourself, how important is this? Does it really matter? Can you step aside and let your husband and your son work this out between them? Do not underestimate the ability of a young child to navigate a conflict with a parent. Even a 20-month-old can do it. Now, are you afraid your husband will harm your son? What's the evidence for this? Is this a realistic fear? When I got together with my second husband, my older son was 11, and they really respected and liked each other. However, they got into conflict, and I had to step aside trusting that, that my new husband would not harm my son and that my son could stand up for himself. Fortunately, this always happened, and so uh, it really has paid off over time. Now. Another question I'm going to ask my listener is what role is your family playing in this conflict? Is this healthy for your marriage? 
Um, the fact that they have called him the food Nazi means they're talking about it and you all have a joke about it together. Is it? Can you hold your own with your husband without bringing in your family to bolster you? Uh, do you like being the outsider with your in-laws? It's natural to be the outsider with your in-laws. But if you don't pay attention to how your family is treating your spouse, then I think then you're, you, you, you are going to have more problems. So how do you negotiate between the two of you? Number one, you, you need to have a private conversation between the two of you. It's just the two of you. Other people are not present. And you set aside a special time for this. And you, so in this situation, you want to keep the focus on the parenting issue at hand. You're not going to bring in other issues. You're not going to bring in the past. You're not going to bring fears about the future. You're just going to focus on this one d- dilemma about how to handle your son at mealtimes with the family. And it's always wise when you're starting a, a negotiation like this to open with a statement of appreciation for the other person. Uh, you appreciate their willingness to, to sit down and discuss this with you, their commitment and support to the marriage and to, the, and to their children. Now, when you do this, you want to allow space and time for each person to articulate their thoughts about what is important about family meal time for the son. And I personally like to use a timer. <laughs> I know it sounds kind of rigid, but it's very useful. Um, while the other, well, one person is speaking, the other one doesn't interrupt. The person speaking doesn't complain about the past or the other person or make derogatory statements. So one person speaks and then the other person speaks and expresses themselves. But again, they're talking about themselves. They don't attack or what the other person has said or argue with what the other person has said. They simply give their view of what's important about mealtime. So there are no, the other, and then the next step is that each person repeats back to their spouse what they heard them say. And you can do this right after the person has spoken, or you can each speak and then do this, but you want to know you were heard. And then that gives the person a chance to know they were heard and to clarify if they, if they feel that they weren't heard. So then again, So then after this, after each person has articulated their position, they take turns to say what point of agreement they found in the other person's perspective. For example, she says, yes, I want our son to be respectful to other family members. She agrees with her husband about that. He says, yes, I love it too when our son is playing and is happy. He agrees about that. And then you take turns to say what you do not agree with. For example, she might say, I don't want him to associate negative emotions with food. And he might say, I don't feel that mealtime is a time to play. This is where they differ. Then you want to brainstorm about compromises. For example, Perhaps you agree that your son will sit at the table at a family meal for a specific period of time with the family, let's say 20 minutes. Then he's allowed to leave the table to play. And then this is negotiated as he gets older and he can sit at the table for a longer time. So that, that, and you could come up with, you know, all kinds of compromises on this, but you come up with something that you can both agree about. Both parents deliver the message to the child and they enforce the compromise. It's okay to acknowledge to yourself and to your child that you have different opinions, but that you work together as a family to come to the best solution. This is more important than the issue at hand. Now, on the other hand, you also have to manage your family. You would need to change your position with your family about your husband's parenting. It has to be authentic and consistent. So perhaps you say to them, you know, we've decided this is important to us and we're going to work it out. And when the term food Nazi comes up again, you don't respond, you don't laugh, and you perhaps you even say something. 
you know, like I, I, I really don't think that that's a, that that's kind or something. I wouldn't get into a fight with your family about it, but you want to find a way to make it clear you're not jumping in with them again. Now they're going to test you and they're going to try to get you back on their side against your husband. They might even talk about you behind your back, but you need to stay neutral, use humor, um, deflect the conversation, let them know that you and he have worked it out and you're content with your decisions. Now to review, um, I hope this has been helpful. I hope that's giving you some ideas about how you can handle the situation. Um, I know this sounds, uh, maybe I make it sound easier than it is. I know how difficult it is, but these are very important moments. These in the family when there are these difficulties. So today, what did I do? I began by emphasizing that parenting is based in the evolution of our species. It is founded in fundamental differences between males and females. This is a strength. It's not a pathology. Um, it may cause tension and problems, but there's nothing wrong. In, in sexual reproduction, in patterns of pair bonding, how, how couples come together, how they mate, or how couples and, and in parenting behaviors, there are differences in, between males and females in all of these areas that are driven by evolution and the desire for each individual to promote their genes, conscious or unconscious. Now, for most of us, it's unconscious. We're not thinking about that. But in fact, this is how a lot of our behavior has been formed. So I've been, and when I talk about this, I talk about other forms of life. I think it's, they're analogous. They're good, you know, analogies. There are things that we can, you know, think of to compare ourselves to, but I, I, I do believe we all evolved, you know, with on these principles in the stream of life. But even if you have other beliefs, if you don't believe in evolution, you can just see them, this range of behavior in other species and compare our behavior to it. It's sometimes helpful to look outside the human being in order to see something more clearly. Um, now, these dynamics that I'm talking about are so ingrained that they also hold for parents, even when the two parents are not the biological parents of the child. So in same-sex couples, you know, one member might be the biological mother. Uh, they might be two men who've adopted a child. They might be a couple who's adopted a child. They're not the biological parent of the child, but the dynamics will hold right? They're so ingrained in who we are and in who we are as males and females that the actual, you know, biological offspring uh, is not necessary for these dynamics to be emphasized. So I then outline the basic emotional dynamics in the family that are the foundation of how we behave and react to each other, individuality and togetherness, and the triangle. These are natural. And anxiety is a natural part of life that is managed by these patterns. So there's nothing wrong with feeling anxiety or tension. There's nothing wrong with anxiety flowing down to us through the generations or in events that happen around us. It's just what life is. And the question is, how do we manage it? So I then gave advice about how to manage yourself in the conflict, negotiate and negotiate respectfully, and then relate to your family um, as, a, as a unit. Um, so at any rate, that's my, uh, that's my um, response today to my listener's question. I thank her very much for submitting that. And um, this is Mercy Russell with a Remarkable Relationship Show. Um, and I'll be back next week. I'm starting to get some interviews in line. I welcome your questions. I welcome your input. You can reach me and could so you can send me a question or a comment. I'd be love to hear any comments or questions about what I've said. And don't feel, don't hesitate to challenge me. I'm up for all of it. 
So you can reach me at mercy at, at, at leadershipwithmercy.com. So anyway, thank you for coming today. And um, I look forward to um, next week.